Okay, let's, uh, let's continue with the lecture where we were discussing uh, strengthening uh, mechanisms in steels. Um, we had uh, closed uh, last time with uh, discussion about stability of uh, microalloying uh, carbides and nitrides. So in particular thermodynamic stability, what does uh, this table mean in effect is that most of the time uh, titanium nitride is so uh, uh, stable that it will bind the nitrogen already in the liquid metal, yes? It's a very efficient way to uh, stabilize, as we say, the, the steel yeah? so that there is no free nitrogen in the steel. Uh, then uh, after solidification of the material, say in a slab or in a billet, uh, in a casting, um, in the austenite phase we will form, uh, if there is niobium uh, in uh, the steel, uh, niobium nitride, and then the uh, vanadium nitride, as you drop the temperature, niobium carbide and titanium carbide already in the austenite. Everything depends, as I've shown you, on the amount of niobium and titanium you, you're adding to the steel, of course, right? As, as you know from the uh, solubility uh, product discussion. Um, so these elements, uh, these compounds rather, will uh, usually uh, precipitate in the austenite, yes? Uh, sometimes the uh, precipitation will be enhanced by deformation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, it'll just uh, be um, the uh, crossing the, the uh, solubility line. And of course, when we have uh, transformation from austenite to uh, ferrite, uh, because of the very low solubility of these compounds, you get um, transformation-induced precipitation of, of the same uh, compounds. And, uh, but what is important is the vanadium, and it's a little bit different, is the vanadium carbide is very soluble in austenite, so it will in generally only form in ferrite, yes? Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that is one of the ways people use to, um, in certain steel products, to have very fine, guaranteed, very fine uh, precipitates that are formed at low temperature, low temperatures. But again, um, uh, so, so important in this entire discussion is the the composition of your steel, yes, what we call the nominal composition, yes, so the, the amount of, uh, the, or the percentage rather of, for instance, niobium, percentage of carbon, the percentage of nitrogen in your steel, and the temperature is important, right? And depending on the composition and the temperature, you, you may or you may not see uh, much of the precipitation. Um, So, and this is, this is shown, illustrated here, for instance, what, what we said. So, um, so you have a temperature axis here, right? Okay. And um, if you have a, a, a steel which contains titanium, and this is 0.2 titanium, that's a, for your information, that's a high content of titanium. But you can see that. The amount of titanium precipitated as titanium nitride yes, is, is close to uh, 100% at very high temperatures. Yes? Okay. Uh, in the case of 
a lower, the same amount of nitrogen, but a lo much lower amount of titanium. You can see that depending on the temperature, the, you go from 60% precipitation to 100% of precipitation by the temperature 115, oh, 1150. This marker doesn't work as well. All right. Um, then you see um, precipitation of niobium carbide and vanadium nitrate in the case of 400 niobium 0.1 carbon. And you see here that at 1200, I have about zero niobium carbide is precipitated. And as I reduce the temperature, it increases to 100% precipitation. Yeah at about 800 degrees C. And the same with vanadium nitride at 0.12% of uh, vanadium and 100 ppm of nitrogen. The precipitation starts at a little over 1,000 and becomes 100% at about 800 degrees C. Now, it's, you can see in the background, I've uh, added a red color that is the temperature range where we typically do hot deformation of steels, whether it's uh, slabs or uh, plates or uh, bar, wire, etc. That's the temperature range, the austenite, high temperature, austenite temperature range when we do the deformation. And so you can see that if you have this type of uh, uh, concentrations of niobium and carbon, and that is uh, uh, very uh, uh, close to the technical amounts of niobium and carbons you have in steels, uh, in low carbon steels, you will, there will be an interference between the precipitation and the uh, microstructural changes which result from the, the, the hot forming, hmm? such as, we've already discussed this, the uh, uh, recrystallization, okay? And uh, finally, uh, vanadium. Hmm? So if you compare, for instance, the behavior of vanadium carbide with vanadium nitride, you see that vanadium, I have about 0.12% of vanadium, same amount of uh, vanadium, but I have 100 ppm of nitrogen. 100 ppm, just to remind you, is 0.01% of nitrogen. So uh, in this case, I have 10 times uh, higher carbon content. Despite this fact, the precipitation of the vanadium carbide starts at low temperatures. Yeah? And typically, uh, uh, very close to the transformation temperature to ferrite, okay? Okay, so vanadium carbide. So you have basically uh, two extremes, titanium nitride precipitates at very high temperatures. The vanadium carbide precipitates at low temperature and most of the time in the... Uh, good. So, so um, what do we see? Yes, is that, um, so you get these small particles, yes. It's important that they are well distributed, yes. If, they, if, if you have processed your steel in such a way that you have these huge bricks of precipitates, like this one here, they're not efficient as uh, for precipitation hardening. Hmm? And what kind of uh, strength, strengthening effect can we get from these small precipitates? Well, typically, our volume fraction, hmm, so that's the, the volume of precipitate, yeah, divided by you know, the, the, the volume of your material, is 10 to the minus 3, yeah, 10 to the minus 3 or less. Right? So it's a very small volume fraction. Hmm? Uh, if, you, if you multiply by 100, it's, it means that you have 0.1 of the uh, uh, volume percentage hmm, is 
uh, actually consists of uh, these carbides that work as precipitation hardeners. Um, and you can see here, um, they are most effective hmm, when they are about, uh, so this is 5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, yes? Uh, excuse me, uh, it's uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters, of course, because it's in microns and it's 10 to 5 times 10 to the minus 3 microns. So that, that's 5 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, so that is 5 nanometers, yes? Uh, so tiny, very tiny particles, yes? And the, the, so if you have this concentration of particles, five nanometer particles, the, the, the strengthening they can give you is about 100 nanometers, yes? And so um, the strengthening effect in these HSLA steel is not only through precipitation. Actually, in general, the precipitation hardening is usually less than this 100 uh, megapascal. You have an additional effect which results from the impact these precipitates have on the recrystallization, and that's the grain refinement, yes? So if you look at conventional carbon manganese steels, yes, and you look at niobium alloy, high strength, low alloy steels, the carbon level, if I compare these two, the carbon level is actually smaller in these HSLA steels, yes? And despite that, you have a strengthening. There are two things are at work. So first of all, uh, what you're seeing here is the yield strength as a function of one over the square root of the grain size. So basically, this is your well-known hall patch uh, uh, law, hmm? empirical law. And you see that uh, for the HSLA steel, we have this line, this hall patch uh, equation. So there are two things at work. First of all, we have an increase here in strength, which is due to precipitation hardening. Yes? And we can, uh, we, we can find out how much it is. So it goes typically about here. It's about this size. So you go from uh, less than, close to, but less than 100 yeah, 100 megapascal in precipitation strengthening. But you get an additional strengthening, yes, which is due to grain size refinement, yes? You see here, these uh, carbon manganese steels, yes, you cannot, it's very difficult to get, you see here there is a cloud of dead points that corresponds to a grain size around 10 micron. Yes. Um, here, with this HSLA steel, we can drop the grain size to 5 micron. So we get an additional increase in, in strength, which is due to grain size. Okay? So in these HSLA steels, you get both grain size refinement and precipitation hardening. Okay? Two uh, strengthening mechanism occur at the same time. All right, so, um, but traditionally, yes, traditionally in very many standard commercial steels, yes, what we, what we use as a strengthening mechanism is basically carbon, yes? We don't use carbon as a solute, yes? We don't use carbon as a solute. We use carbon in the form of cementite, yes? yes? And in fact, the carbon itself is present as cementite in perlite. Hmm? So if we look at the standard commercial so-called 
ferrite perlite steel, yes, what we see in the microstructure is this. You see uh, this black face, which is perlite, and this, these white grains, which are ferrite, yes? So, you're, and where does the strength come from? Well, the perlite is a very strong constituent. It's not a phase, as you know. It's a constituent in the sense that it, it consists of alternate plates of uh, uh, Fe3C, which is cementite or theta, and, um, you know, and ferrite. So it's act so th this um, a, a carbon manganese steel is actually a composite. Yeah? It's a composite of a soft phase, the ferrite. This is a stress strain curve for the ferrite here. Yes, you can see, very soft, and a uh, very hard phase, uh, cementite. Cementite. I, I think I I, um, I I said it wrongly. So the the perlite is a composite of ferrite and cementite, and the stress strain curve for the ferrite is shown here, and the stress strain curve for the cementite is shown here. Yes. And you can see cementite is an extremely hard carbide, yes? It's actually very hard to test it because it's, 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 it's very hard and brittle, yes? So what happens when you uh, deform a composite, yes? Um, you get stress-strain behavior that's in between both, yes? So, um, in particular, hmm, um, so you get a phase yes, that's in between both. Yeah, so, so this would be the perlite uh, stress strain curve, for instance. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah. So, if you, well, when you change the carbon content of a, in an iron carbon alloy at about 0.8% you have a perfect eutectoid composition so this is this is actually pure perlite yeah? okay and the tensile stress tensile strength of the perlite is about a thousand megapascal yeah? when you reduce the uh, carbon content to 0.3, yes, then you get something that looks like this. So it, it will contain uh, not 100% perlite, but 50% perlite, and not 0% uh, ferrite in this case, but 50%. And because you have added more of the soft phase, your strength, your tensile strength will be lowered. Hmm? It's as if you diluted the strength of the perlite. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So, um, from this diagram that we, uh, from this uh, strength situation that we just discussed, it is clear that um, if we want to understand uh, strength of steel, we, we need to know how we're going to make uh, the microstructure. Yeah? And so to make microstructures or, or have an idea of how to make a microstructure, we use phase diagrams. Yeah? And they're very useful. These phase diagrams are an easy tool to determine what phases I have at a temperature and for a certain uh, steel composition, what, are, what these phases are, what is the composition of each phase. And we can do this at different temperatures and different nominal alloy compositions. Hmm? And in this diagram, we can also indicate where we will have eutectoids, which give us lamellar microstructures, such as the, uh, uh, such as perlite. Hmm? Um, and um, we can change this, uh, or look at changes in this phase diagram to help us uh, change the mechanical properties. Okay? So 
in this, so if I now uh, look at the same iron carbon diagram I just showed you, and I put in the phases, yes, I can now uh, put some names on uh, different areas in this phase diagram. So we can determine the fraction of osnite and ferrite and cementite at any given temperature and composition, nominal composition, of course. And uh, we can also see that uh, there is this eutectoid point here, which will uh, generate the uh, perlite. Hmm? Okay, um, what is important um, for, uh, for steels, many steel products, is the fact that um, there are many parts of this diagram we don't really look at, or very rarely. You know? And uh, first of all, I want to remind you of the fact that all the steels are limited to about 2% uh, of carbon. So you can pretty much, you know, very often ignore this part of the diagram. Then, um, unless you're interested in casting, Yes, and, and problems related to casting, um, you're also usually with steel products uh, limited in your interest to the solid when you reheat it, when, you, when it's been cast and you're going to process it. So, and that usually, this reheating process usually is 1300 degrees C or less. So it's, you reheat typically your steels in this zone, right? So you basically are left with a, a, a piece of the phase diagram, yes? The uh, right-hand side, the iron-rich, uh, the left-hand side, or the iron-rich corner of the iron-carbon diagram that we're actually going to look at in practice. When, <coughs> hmm? So that's a very simple diagram, hmm? okay? Uh, this diagram is sensitive to uh, the composition. Yeah? First of all, we know that uh, this eutectoid uh, temperature will, will change as we uh, alloy. And we see that all the alloying elements cause a uh, reduction of the uh, eutectoid uh, temperature. Okay, excuse me, um, this is not it, um, also uh, not the, the, the carbon content of the eutectoid. Uh, so, so this point always moves to the uh, left as we alloy the, uh, the steel with any, uh, whether it's a austenite stabilizer or a ferrite stabilizer, we always go to a, a lower content of um, carbon to have a fully perlitic microstructure. What does this mean? For instance, um, if, you, if you want to have a fully perlitic microstructure in, that consists of uh, a microstructure that consists fully of perlite, you need 0.8% of carbon. However, if your steel contains a, say, uh, so 2% is here, 1% is here. So if you add 1 or 2% of chromium, yes, the, the carbon content at which you can get a fully prolytic microstructure is reduced to 0.6.7, yes? And remember the perlite is, is the hard phase we have in carbon manganese steels. So it allows you to have less carbon and strength by adding an alloying element. The, the way the, the temperature moves, yes, depends on whether you have austenite stabilizers or ferrite stabilizers. The ferrite stabilizers extend this domain, yes, so the temperature will move up. Austenite stabilizers such as manganese and nickel increase this domain, the austenite stabilizing domain. So 
there the eutectoid temperature decreases. All right. Good. So um, we will um, be talking in uh, the following terms. So there are a number of things uh, following um, um, how shall I say parameters yes when we talk about steels and I think um, there are not many things you may want to uh, learn by heart uh, or just know um, if, if you're a steel specialist but uh, in terms of temperatures and composition but I think it's important for you that you have a, a grasp of some uh, temperature so I think um, uh, you should know that uh, eutectoid temperatures are typically around 727 in the iron carbon diagram and, and as I said that depend where they actually are will depend on composition uh, that this point here uh, the uh, temperature at which you have the, uh, the lowest temperature at which you have austenite stability is this where you have also the eutectoid uh, reaction yes that's at around 0.8 percent of carbon, 0.77, um, and that um, all compositions that are they have carbon constant less than this are called hypoeutectoid, and many steels are hypoeutectoid steels. Yes? Whereas a carbon content uh, higher than this point of it are called hypereutectoid. Also, uh, it may be of interest to you to know that uh, you know, the, the actual carbon content in the, uh, in the cementite is 6.7 uh, weight percent, yes? But the uh, atomic percent is, of course, 25 atomic percent, right? Because you have one carbon atom out of four atoms, yeah? So, uh, and also, um, when you look at data in the literature or from other people, always make sure uh, that uh, the units that are being used, whether it's at atomic or, or mole percents, uh, percents or fractions, yeah? and uh, whether it's in mass or weight percent or atomic percents. Hmm? All right. Um, all right. Um, so very low carbon content steels, such as uh, so-called interstitial free steels, which contain 30 ppm of carbon and 40 uh, ppm of nitrogen. Although there are carbides in these materials and nitrides, that's what they look like. Pretty much single phase uh, microstructure of ferrite grains. Yes? And and that is, a, as I already said, a, a, a relatively soft microstructure. All right? Okay. So this, uh, this is um, the steel that you just saw, yes? Um, if, if I want to indicate it on this diagram, actually I, I cannot because it's actually located here somewhere. So on this scale of things, uh, the steel composition of the example I just showed you is, is somewhere hidden here. So I need to blow this up, yes, blow this up, and then I see that uh, close to the y-axis, I actually have a domain of stability for ferrite containing carbon hmm? and the maximum so this this is pure uh, single phase ferrite excuse me containing uh, carbon and the maximum uh, solubility of this uh, carbon so that's at around the eutectoid temperature this maximum solubility is close to 200 ppm so 200 ppm is a typical maximum solubility of carbon. And that's one thing. And then the second thing is you can see that as you decrease the temperature, 
uh, this solubility goes close to zero. All right. The important, again, important uh, point is uh, that at 0.77%, we have a microstructure which will look uh, essentially like the example shown here, uh, a lytic microstructure where uh, we have alternating layers of ferrite and cementite. Mm -hmm. And Right? And what happens if I go beyond that point? Yes? If I go beyond this, uh, this point, and in particular, if I go beyond this 2%, yes, you see that I will have cementite will be formed. In particular here, uh, if you have a steel decomposition or a, a, an alloy at this composition, when I cross this eutectoid, eutectic, excuse me, temperature, yes, I will form from the liquid, I will form austenite and uh, cementite. So you have very strong, um, large amounts of either carbide or uh, in cast irons, uh, you, you get uh, graphite, yes? This material is, is very important. Many uh, castings are still produced with uh, this nodular uh, shaped uh, graphite mm -hmm. uh, in automotive products also, and in particular like motors, yes? Um, and, um, but we will not be talking about it because they're, they're cast irons, yes? Um, okay. Now, if we just let's go back. If we now go close to this eutectoid temperature, yes, we have two situations. Yeah? If we are on the left, yeah, on the left of the uh, eutectoid, then we will form what's called pro pro eutectoid ferrite, yes, before we form perlite, and this is what we see here, yes. If we are beyond the uh, eutectoid composition, so if we are on the right, yes, or we have a hyper eutectoid steel. Yeah? In this case, we had a hypo eutectoid steel. Yes? We are on the, on the right. Um, we have mainly perlite, yes? but you can see here at the boundary, we have some primary cementite. So we have some a, a layer here. You can see this white layer here, right? That is cementite. Yes? In this case, we have vastly different mechanical behavior. Here we have a boundary layer, if you want, which consists of soft ferrite. Here I have a boundary layer, which consists of very hard and brittle uh, cementite. Yeah? Right? And this is shown a little bit uh, here. So on the left here of this um, eutectoid composition, I will have um, primary ferrite, yeah? and on this I have primary uh, cementite will form. Yes? So you can see here at 0.2% of carbon, hmm, when I, I cool down this steel with this composition, the first phase I form will be uh, ferrite, yes? And I will, that amount will increase, yes? Mm -hmm. As I cool down. Mm -hmm. And then eventually when I reach this temperature, the untransformed austenite becomes 
perlite. Hmm? Of course, the, at point 5, yes, I start to form ferrite here. I will never form as much uh, ferrite as in the case of 0.2. And I will form a lot more perlite when I transform uh, the uh, untransformed austenite when I pass the eutectoid temperature. Hmm? And on this side, as I already explained, when I cool down on this side, the first phase I, uh, the, the, I, I form additionally at the grain boundaries of austenite, I form cementite. And you can see this here, the same picture as just a moment ago of cementite uh, films at the grain boundary, the grain boundaries that were originally the austenite grain boundaries. Okay? So basically, for instance, for eutectoid uh, composition, as I change the carbon content, I go from a microstructure which contains a lot of ferrite, a little bit of cementite, to a gradually increasing volume fraction of perlite and eventually everything is perlite in the microstructure. All right. Uh, right, so there are other transformations here. I, I will, uh, oh, this is the perlite microstructure here. Uh, when you uh, look at it, one of the uh, defining parameters in this uh, microstructure is uh, the distance between the lamellas, yes? Distances between these uh, perlite lamellas. Uh, and we'll see that uh, this distance is mainly determined by the temperature at which we uh, form the uh, perlite and also the size of the perlite colony. So you can see here all the lats are parallel, yes, up to here and up to there. So these uh, perlite, you have perlite colonies, right? So that's also a factor that's of importance in this uh, microstructure. All right? So let's look at this uh, transformation, at this, it's uh, transformation um, in more detail. So at high temperature, if we have a steel, yes, um, with exactly 0.77% uh, of carbon, and it's austenitic, yes, and I cool it down slowly through this temperature, through the UTEC, I will get perlite. However, yes, there are, diff there are different ways in which I can do this cooling down, yes? Uh, I can cool down slowly, just go slowly at a certain slow rate of heat removal, yes? Or I can do it very quickly. Hmm? I can do it very quickly. Hmm? I can go suddenly, say, I have a steel sample or a part, I can go from 900 degrees C from a furnace at 900 degrees C and I can put it in a furnace that's at 650 degrees C, yes, suddenly, and then keep it there. Yeah? In both cases, I, you know, I will end up forming perlite, but it will be different. Yeah? The microstructure will be different, okay? And, um, and so we can look at the growth of this perlite, yes, by doing exactly this simple temperature, uh, uh, thermal cycle rather, of putting your material from a high temperature in austenite stability range to a furnace at different temperatures below 727. And what we see, yes, um, first of all, let's uh, just make sure yeah. The, the temperature at which we do this, yes, yes uh, is below 727. So we call this the undercooling, yes, the amount, the, the amount of degrees below the, uh, the transformation temperature, the eutectoid temperature. Right? Okay, and what we see is that 
the, ost the austenite transforms to this perlite, but that it does this at different rates. It, in the, the kinetics of the transformations are different. So, for instance, if we take a very large uh, undercooling, a large delta T, so 600 degrees C, that means the delta T is 127 degrees, yeah? That would be large, yes? Uh, we see that it takes less than 10 seconds to transform fully. Hmm? If we take a much smaller, yes, hmm? uh, under cooling, it's like 675, hmm? so that means the uh, under cooling is uh, about, about 50 degrees, yes? Minus 50 degrees, I should make it minus 127, yeah? Um, we see that the transformation also happens, but much smaller, right? Much smaller uh, velocity or kinetics. And you see here it takes more than 100 seconds, a uh, few hundred seconds to do the, the transformation, yes? And uh, so, so why is this? Well, it's because uh, this transformation is the result of nucleation and growth. Yes, and uh, we can explain um, why we get these S types of curves okay? um, if we have the amount of transformation as a function of the log of the time, yes, uh, by simply um, thinking of uh, the transformation as a nucleation stage, yes, and a growth stage. In the nucleation stage, you make very, very tiny nuclei. Yeah? And in the growth stage, these nuclei grow. Yes? So here I have what we call a nucleation rate. That means number of little particles, <coughs> uh, little, units <coughs> little units of perlite being created per unit of time. <coughs> in the growth stage, we're looking at how does the radius of these particles change with time. Hmm? Yep. And what we see is that the nucleation stage, the rate of nucleation, is high when the undercooling is high. Uh, hmm? The reason is because the driving force for the uh, for the formation of perlite is high. And the growth stage is high at high temperature. And that's because, so at small delta T's, that's because the higher the temperature is, the easier we have diffusion, yes? And diffusion is required to form the perlite, yeah? Eventually, this curve doesn't continue to increase, yes? but it falls off. I get this S-type curve, and that's because the particles are in the impingement stage. They have become so large, yes, that they touch each other, and they cannot grow in all directions anymore, right? So it's the impingement stage, yeah? By the way, um, if, if you would plot this same curve not in a... Uh, um, uh, transformation log t, yes, it, would, it wouldn't look like an S-curve. This requires that you do log t. If you just have t, then it would probably, it would look like this, okay? Just be careful hmm? when uh, this, this, this S-curve, you know, because very often in undergraduate studies, People talk about S curves, but they don't. You know, if, that's only if you plot it as a log t. Yeah, log t. Um, right. All right. So this is the sequence, right? And what are the, so there are two things. Um, uh, you have nucleation and growth. Yeah, and but it's also important for you to realize that a nucleation step and growth step are not, they don't occur separately. It's, it, the, the material doesn't, the, the perlite doesn't decide to, and now it's the first 10 seconds I'm going to nucleate, and the rest of the time I'm going to grow, right? It, these are concurrent processes, yes? 
No? And the, so, so for the nucleation step, you have the nucleation rate, which tells you how many nuclei are produced per unit of time and per unit of volume, yes? And this is very much controlled by the, uh, the free energy change of the formation of the perlite in this particular case, yes? So that's the driving force. Yeah. Whereas the growth rate, there we have simply an increase of the radius of these nuclei as a function of time. And the growth rate depends on basically on the fusion constants, which are temperature dependent. Yeah? So if we look at the volume, the simple volume, and we look at this, for instance, the perlite formation as a function of time at a certain temperature, let's say we form two particles per unit of time. So that means that after a time delta t, yes, we have two particles, two nuclei, yes? And the next delta t time that uh, passes by, I form two new uh, nuclei, but, and what happens also is the, this nucleus here starts to grow, right? And it grows by an amount delta R. Delta R, which is my growth rate times, um, well, I don't, uh, I don't know why I put, yeah, one, yeah, this is what, yeah, um, delta T. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Delta T being the unit of time. Okay. So this is one unit, two units, three. So, okay. Not two delta T, right? Um, and then in the next frame, again, I nucleate two more particles. The particles that were originally nucleated are now have now a radius increase that's the growth rate times two times delta t, yes? The ones that were created in the previous uh, frame have now g times delta t as a radius, etc. cetera. And, and then you can see they all grow, they all have different radii, and they um, eventually they impinge on each other, yes? And that's why the transformation rate doesn't go like this. Hmm? And you, you start, so here, in this case, you start to have impingement from that point on it. Okay? So if now the previous slide was something very general. In the case of, of perlite, you form the perlite in austenite, of course, yes? If we are very close to the eutectoid temperature, we have a very low nucleation rate, but a very high growth rate. And so we will get coarse particles, coarse uh, large islands, large islands, and coarse perlite. Yeah? As we uh, are have a temperature that's really below the eutectoid temperatures. There we have very high nucleation rate because I'm very far away from equilibrium conditions with my austenite, but my growth rate is low. So I get very fine, very small uh, uh, perlite uh, colonies and very tiny uh, lamellar spacings. Okay. This um, information here, yes, this transformation curves uh, can be used you know, in uh, to make two-dimensional plots where you say if I if so th this is the eutectoid temperature, this is eutectoid temperature minus delta t, I can mark points where the transformation at a certain temperature, this, this is for instance at, the, at a certain temperature, hmm, the transformation will be 
this much percent. So I can now use this to, so if I do the transformation at one temperature, at this temperature, I can use these, this transformation plot to indicate, oh, here is this, this, the transformation uh, starts, here it's 50% transform, and here it's uh, finished. Yeah? And if I have, say, a transformation at 550. Mm -hmm. uh, this means that this means that it starts at this time after uh, about uh, two, two seconds it's 50 percent and at uh, say eight or nine seconds it's here. So the transformation rate is like this. At, this would be transformation at 550. Hmm? Okay, so I can get this uh, this uh, TTT diagram for the austenite to perlite transformation. Okay, right. So and and this is basically what happens in the microstructure. Hmm? The austenite, we get the grain. Uh, uh, boundaries in the austenite where the uh, perlite starts to nucleate, yes, and uh, in between 50% of it, between uh, this uh, green dot and the red dot, I have about 50% of the transformation is done, and by the time I reach, this is a few hundred seconds at 675, I find this um, at the microstructure is fully uh, transformed, yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, why, um, so, so why is it that the, uh, uh, again, so the important here is that the, when the perlite grows, the, uh, the two phases in the perlite, so the cementite and the ferrite, grow at the same time. They grow together. And what basically happens is that the, the austenite uh, ahead of uh, this basically transfers carbon from the region where the ferrite grows to the region where the uh, carbide grows. And we'll go more into the details of the thermodynamics as, as we go. But at this stage, I just want to say that if we are very close below the eutectoid temperature, we have faster diffusion, we have coarse perlite, yes, and, um, and we have large colonies, yes, so this situation. If we are, we have a very high undercooling, we have slow diffusion, fine perlite, and, lar and excuse me, small colonies, yes. All right, okay. Now, you remember that I told you around 550 something s happens to substitutional solutes, yes? And in particular, uh, they just stop diffusion. The diffusion of uh, solute is pretty much finished. And below that, um, you only get uh, uh, Interstitial diffusion, so carbon, nitrogen can still diffuse, but not the other atoms. And so um, when, they, uh, they, when they do move, they, they do this by shear deformation, uh, shear transformation, I should say, not shear deformation, mm -hmm. shear transformation. And there are two types of uh, transformations where you have uh, the, the, the shear happening, that is bainite, bainitic transformation, and the martensitic transformation. The difference between the two is related to a simple uh, uh, a difference, is that in bainite, the interstitials can diffuse. In martensite, they do not diffuse during the transformation. That's the big difference, okay? So, 
Uh, this C curve that, that we just showed, actually, if you're below this nose at 550, what you, what you obtain is bainite. And the microstructure doesn't look at all anymore like perlite, like alternating uh, uh, layers, lamellas of ferrite and uh, uh, perlite. Hmm? Because we are dealing with a combination of a diffusionless, a shear transformation, or shear transformation. I'll show you in a moment what that looks like. And a diffusion controlled processes. And the diffusion control is related to the interstitial diffusion. Hmm? Okay? So above this temperature, you can form perlite. Below this temperature, no more. Even though your uh, concentration, your, your concentration of carbon, 0.77, is, is unchanged. Okay, at this st st stage, again, for the people who are unfamiliar with uh, transformation, you do not form bainite if you cool down slowly from the eutectoid temperature to room temperature. You always get perlite. You get bainite when you go suddenly from austenite to a temperature 550. Yes? When you, do the, when you force the material to transform at lower temperature. Yes? So that, that's important, right? That you have to go force the material to force the austenite to transform at low temperature. Okay, and this is what the, the, the bainite looks like. And you can see uh, any uh, lamellas are gone. You get very small structural units. Uh, you, the microstructure does contain carbides, but they're very, very small carbides, yes? So that not, nothing like the, the, the very large uh, cementite lamellas that we get in the perlite. All right? Well, let's do another experiment, yes? Another isothermal experiment, yes? Uh, say you, you, you transform the austenite at 600 degrees C, right? 600 degrees C. And so first you make perlite and say, well, okay, let's just keep it there. Keep it at 600 degrees C for a few hours, yes? Will the microstructures change? Yes, the microstructure change, changes. Uh, what you get is in s that this perlite, perlite, excuse me, instead of uh, remaining lamellar, turns into this microstructure. And you can see the, the lamellas are gone, and instead is re the, the cementite lamellas are gone, and instead is replaced by small, more or less spherical particles, which we call um, uh, spherodite. The structure is called spherodite because of these spherical cementite particles. Mm -hmm. So we obtain ferrite and spherical uh, cementite if we diffuse, if we let the carbon diffuse for a very long time. And this will happen both in bainite and perlite because, uh, because these two microstructures are not the lowest energy microstructures that we should have. And in particular, um, the, uh, the, the reason why uh, they have such a high energy is because there are lots of interfaces in the microstructure of perlite and bainite. Yes? And whenever you have interfaces, you have interfacial energies. They may not be very high, but if you have lots of interfaces, it adds up. So the system will try to reduce this interfacial energy. So
And of course, uh, if you have a certain volume, small, one of the smallest, the smallest uh, energy you can have is by making it spherical, yeah? reduce the surface energy. Yeah? All right, and this is an example here of this spherodite, yes, globular uh, cementite. And that material, uh, that microstructure is very soft, yes, and uh, there are uh, uh, many products uh, where uh, that is actually one of the steps we pass through to make a final product, yes? Even if you want to make very hard products, like ball bearings, for instance, we do this with uh, steel compositions, which in, uh, will generally be perlitic, yes? We, we pass through the spherodizing treatment in order to have a soft intermediate state, yes? which allows to, uh, for the shaping. So we, were t we talked about bainite already as a shear transformation. Martensite um, is, uh, is the typical um, shear transformation, which is associated with no diffusion whatsoever. So it's, a, it's a rapid and it's diffusionless. So substitutional and interstitials do not diffuse. The structure in general, certainly when we have larger carbon contents, is not cubic but tetragonal, hmm? and that's caused by carbon supersaturation. Hmm? Hmm? And this transformation is for steel products is generally a-thermal. There, so a-thermal, which means that the amount we transform of austenite depends on the temperature only. It does not depend on time. So time has no influence. Now, martensite transformation, um, is occurs in very many different material systems, mm -hmm. not only steel. Yes, right. You, it, it occurs in other metals, other alloys, in oxide systems. You name it. It's not something that's typically a steel thing. And there are many people studying martensitic transformation of one kind or another. Yes that don't do any steels, yes? For instance, shape memory alloys are based on martensitic transformations, okay? That's just an example that comes to mind, uh, which you may know of, right? So, uh, so if we have a high carbon steel, this is what the martensite look like. You see uh, these feathery structures here, that's martensite. The white structure in the background here, that's untransformed austenite. Yeah? And that untransformed austenite will stay untransformed for as long as you wait. Yes? Uh, and unless I change the temperature, nothing will happen. Yes? Because it's time independent. Hmm? Okay? So that is why the martensite transformation in this TTT diagram, we have horizontal lines. Yes? That means um, if I do the transformation at this temperature, say 150 degrees C, yes, I will form about 50% of martensite, and then it doesn't matter how long I wait, I still have 50% of martensite. The only way to get 100% is by cooling it further to, for instance, 100 degrees C, yes, and then I will get the full transformation, okay? So that is when we say the transformation, it's an athermal transformation, okay? Depends on temperature only. You see here, this transformation here, it depends on the time, yes? I transform more, but it also depends on the temperature, right? If I if I do it at this temperature, I will get different amounts of transformation, okay? So, 
All right? And this is the, what the martensite looks like. This is uh, the most common type of martensite you see in, in steels. That's lath martensite. Yes? And you get it in low carbon steels. Yes? And you see the units are very small. Yes? And again, uh, it's actually rather difficult to see any structure in optical uh, metallography. Usually, if you really want to describe the microstructure of martensite, you have to use, uh, and of veinite, you have to use high resolution methods. But this is what you would see under an optical microscope or a low magnification electron microscopy uh, image. Hmm? And this is at high uh, carbon content. Yeah? And the magnification about the same. So you can see the martensite, um, this is a high carbon martensite, the, the, the martensite transformation, even in steel, will be different depending on the temperature. Hmm? And um, typically, I don't know if I have the, the diagram. Typically, if this is the carbon content, yeah, and this is the temperature at which the martensite starts, the MS temperature. Yeah. For instance, if I go back to this slide, so this means here that a little bit bo above 200 degrees C, the martensite transformation starts, so it's called the martensite start temperature. So, right, the martensite start temperature is very much a um, uh, carbon content dependent. So, this is what it looks like. The martensite temperature decreases with uh, temperature. This is the martensite start temperature, but we also have a martensite finish temperature, right? Because I need to cool down enough to get the full transformation. So that's usually, it depends very much on the, the composition of the steel, but as a rule, if you want to, you don't, you don't have much information, the MF temperature is about 100 to 150 degrees lower, right? So, 100 to 150 degrees, that's the MF. Yeah? So if I have austenite here, yes, austenite here, I, with this much carbon, I cool down, martensite transformation will start at this temperature and will be finished at this temperature. And here at room temperature, I get 100% martensite. But this goes down. What, what happens if my carbon content is this? And now I cool down austenite to room temperature. What happens? Well, I will start transforming, yes? But I will stop transforming when I reach room temperature, right? So the structure will look like this, so this would be my austenite grain. Yes. I will start forming martensite, but there will be some austenite will remain in the microstructure. Yeah. And when that happens, we, we are talking about, we don't say remaining, it's remaining austenite, of course, but we, we call it retained austenite. Retained austenite. Okay, that's, and uh, so that will become important. The presence of retained austenite will become important as we increase the carbon content in our steel grades. Yeah. And, and by the way, this is this is what you see here, right? You see here there is some these feathery structures. That's the martensite, and here this. This is here untransformed or retained austenite. So that's how I know that this is a high carbon martensite. You also notice uh, that it's a very different microstructure. Yes? So also what happens is as you increase the carbon content, the 
the microstructure hmm, of the Martin site changes. It's not, it's not uh, uh, lath Martin site anymore, but it's plate-like Martin site. Okay, when, when we do this transformation, yes, we have a shear transformation. So it's important to realize what is a shear transformation is that the location of all the atoms before and after the transformation is defined yes, by the shear. Yeah? So there is no randomness to the position of the atoms before and after the transformation. Yeah? It's very different from a diffusional process because a diffusional process, the atoms will move back and forth and maybe in a randomly selected final position, yes? So, and, and the shear, for instance, if you look at a little um, segment of the austenite uh, uh, lattice, yes? What happens is this shear occurs, right? So the, the, this whole pyramid, if you want, or uh, yeah, pyramid is shifted so that uh, this plane here becomes a vertical plane, yes? And you see that when this happens, yeah, all these atoms are now moving up a little saddle point here, so you have an increase in volume and a shear. So two things happen during Martin side transfer. You get a large shear and a, a volume increase, yeah? And one of the things you can also see, which is rather neat, that's why I'm showing it here, is that the atoms on this plane, which forms, which is a 111 gamma plane, now are changed, have exactly, and have exactly this, the right position, and so this plane becomes a 110 alpha plane. Yeah. So there will be uh, orientation, in other words, there will be orientation relationships between the austenite and the ferrite, or, or the martensite that we get. Hmm? Oh, yeah, another thing, um, when we talk about bainite and martensite, it's basically ferrite, okay? But the, the way that ferrite was created was through a bainitic transformation or through a martensitic transformation, yes? So, and the, as I said, what is a martensitic transformation? It's, uh, it's a shear transformation and it's absolutely no diffusion, okay? That's, and so it's, this definition can be applied to many material systems and it has nothing to do specifically with steel. It's a very general concept, this martensite transformation. Also, uh, uh, don't be confused, martensite is not brittle, okay? Many times people say, oh, you know, martensitic transformation, then you always think about brittleness. There's not, nothing about uh, uh, a martensitic transformation makes a material brittle, right? Why is it that we, uh, or often, brittleness is associated with martensite in steels? It's because the carbon supersaturation, yes? It's because there's, it's supersaturated. When we do a martensitic transformation in steels very often, the carbon is, ends up in supersaturation and that makes it brittle, yes? Not, um, so, so Martin, not the transformation, right? Hmm? And in fact, there are, there's a family of steels called Mar aging steels, yes? where uh, to make a part in my aging steels, yes, uh, or to, to make the, the thermal treatment possible, yes, and obtain extremely high uh, stresses, there is an intermediate part where we form very soft martensite, yes, and the way it's being done is simply by, by having absolutely no or very little carbon in solution. That's, yeah. So martensite is not brittle or hard, 
Yes, it's only brittle and hard if there is, in, in, in our case, uh, carbon in solid solution, in supersaturation. All right, so come to the uh, end of the lectures. And um, for your information, on Wednesday, I will be absent, yes, but there is a regular quiz and regular lecture. Okay, so you come here and it will be taken care of. My absence is being taken care of, so you will get the class and you will get the quiz, all right? So please do come. The color, the color, yeah. but that's contrast. Oh, now I, I see hyper eutectal. Yeah, so the. Um, the um, w w whether something looks uh, black or white in uh, a microscope uh, has has to do with the reflectivity. Yes. So if you um, reflectivity and the reflectivity uh, of that surface, yeah. If if something is very smooth, yes it will reflect light very well, okay? If, if something is uh, not smooth, for instance, a grain boundary, yes? Yes, it, it may reflect light at the wrong angle, right? So that's usually something that's very bright. Yeah? It just means that it's very flat and there are no uh, there are no defects that would scatter or diffuse the light. Yeah? So uh, the, um, uh, the other way a phase can look black yes, is when it is uh, like this, yes? when it's rough. Yeah? And it can become rough when you etch it. Uh, typically, if it has lots of defects in it, uh, like dislocations, they will form tiny little pits, yes? And that will give you uh, a rough surface, and that will diffuse the light, and it will look like uh, it will look black, right? Um, so the... Uh, yeah, so the, 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 that's basically what happens in that, in that picture, yes? Is that the very, the, the hard, the uh, pro, pro eutectoid cementite is very hard, and when you polish it, you really mirror polish it, yes? And it has this very bright, very high brightness, yes? And it apparently etches differently than the, um, than the perlite case.